to John Molnar, the owner of Cod Scallops Group, which operate from four sites in Nottingham and an outpost in Birmingham. We have had John on the Sarah's podcast before, so if you want to get acquainted with him, go ahead and listen to episode 45 from February 2020. In this episode, we discuss the expansion of the Cod Scallops and how it hasn't been without its challenges, especially against the backdrop of the cost of living crisis and COVID. John shares insights into the performances of his outlets, the tough decisions around site closures and the operational nuances managing a restaurant group spread across the East Midlands and a single location in Birmingham. The conversation delves into menu pricing strategies, uh, commodity prices, employment costs, balancing the act of menu development to maintain efficiency and to keep customers happy. Today's episode is brought to you by Sarah's Curry Sauce. Imagine a curry sauce that perfectly marries sweetness with spice, with spices from around the world including turmeric, onion, cumin, cardamom, fenugreek from India, black pepper from Madagascar, tomato powder from Italy, coriander, chilli and fennel from Turkey. The Ceres curry sauce offers a versatile base that is delicious on its own or you can also use it as a base so it can be customised to your heart's desire. With Ceres curry sauce, you can unlock endless possibilities in your kitchen. And for those mindful of their customers' dietary needs, rejoice in our naturally gluten-free, free free from any nasties, colourings or preservatives. It's pure, unadulterated essence of curry sauce in every pot. But here's the kicker. Our concentrated formula means a little goes a really long way. Just five kilos of our curry sauce transforms into 41 kilos of ready to use curry sauce. That's under six pence a portion. So why give your customers ordinary when they can have extraordinary? Indulge them with Sarah's curry sauce and create sales, but more importantly, keep customers coming back for more. Order the Ceres Curry Sauce from Ceres.shop with free delivery to mainland UK. We also deliver to Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, the British Isles. Ship to Belgium, France, Italy, Germany, Luxembourg, Netherlands, Spain and Greece. Now, let's get back to the show. On Wednesday, I attended the National Federation of Fish Fryers Fish and Chip Awards. It was a great event for so many friends and customers. As I was texting a friend of mine, the result... I was taken by surprise when Dan Rosser from Noah's, who was sitting next to me, started tapping me saying they'd called my name. Of course, I was expecting to be a runner-up to two great companies in the lineup. So I thank you all for your votes. I appreciate it a lot. We will keep working hard to improve our offering to you. I'd also like to say a big well done to the organisers at the NFFF. I'd also like to say a big well done to the winners of the main category, Ryan and Kimberly Hughes from Ship Deck and Kefilly. These two truly deserve the recognition. They begged and borrowed to, from friends and family to build the Ship Deck, and they've been tireless at building their family business from scratch. For a full listing of all the winners, visit our blog. If you want to keep in the loop of what we're doing at Ceres, then you should be following us on social media, but to get information and offers, join our mailing list. The link will be in the show notes. Remember, the only place you will see special offers from us is in your inbox. We will never post on social media about special offers. On to today's episode with John Molner from Cod Scallops. Let us know what you think about this episode and be sure to leave us a review on your favourite podcast player. John, welcome to the Sarah's podcast, mate. Great to have you on again. Yeah, good morning, pal. You well? Yeah, we are, mate. We're all good here, good. just plugging away. So, uh, uh, like we just discussed earlier, I'd, I wanted to have you on again. We had you on when you'd won Fish and Chips for the year, but a lot has happened in the last few years. With um, well, there was co- well, there was winning, there was COVID, there was there's been inflationary things going on. Um, what I'd like to know is how you've managed it all, and that's why we thought we'd get you back on. Yeah, no problem at all. Yeah, it has been a strange old uh, few years, hasn't it? But we're still here. We're still trying. 
keep so telling you, myself God loves a trier. So well, this uh, is yeah, true. This is true. <laughs> so if we look back directly to where we sort of left off um, in the previous episode, was you'd won fish and chips for the year. You know, looking back, was that a good time? Did you see a huge increase in trade? Um, we did, I guess, for the short period until lockdown, we did. Um, I don't think we uh, benefited uh, as much as we would have done if, if we wouldn't have had code. Of course not. You know, we had six weeks of where, at one point, we were over-trading, and we were over-trading. I mean, luckily, well, not luckily, we had the infrastructure to make sure the product was still as brilliant. So, you know, we didn't just, you know, I've heard stories of some shops falling on their arse and not being able to cope. And we didn't have that because we had, you know, we had two or three shops and we just pulled extra staff in and geared up and, and you know, we jumped on and I jumped back in and, and, and we made sure that the product was right and the customers got, you know, an exceptional product. So, yeah, we, we were good for that period. And then obviously lockdown, um happened and and no one could have predicted what was what was the next i guess 18 months of of shit really <laughs> but yeah. um you know we're, we're back we're back again and we, we're trying and we, we we had to adapt our business and we went to click and collect like most other shops and went on the delivery platforms and and you know kicked on and still here so yeah so you were the last technically <clears throat> the last fish and chips of the year one under sea fish so, and obviously now it's a new platform. It's with the NFFF. Um, what was that feeling like? Like, because obviously technically, uh, on paper, the longest serving fish and chips for the year winner. But even because of everything that happened, you probably didn't get to capitalise on it as much as most. Um, but what was that like? Did that have any weird complications? Um, I think. I mean, I would love to enter again. I think the whole, you know, I've been told by Andrew Crook. I mean, what what frustrates me, I think, um, a few things frustrate me, but what frustrates me with the whole ethos behind the competitions was, or the competition, you know, Andrew Crook openly states to me that no one can do a, pres after we won, well, no one can do a presentation like you, John. I don't know whether that was a compliment or uh, you know what? What no one's gonna no one's gonna do it as good as you. So so we're not you know. And then there was the whole thing. I can't enter again because now I've got more than one shop. But I had more than one shop when I won it. So my point to Andrew Crook was: Well, look, I would love to enter it again. And I I honestly believe that we're still the best in the UK. I really do. I think I think there's you know. He said, Well, you can't enter it because there's more than one shop. I said, well, I entered it and won in 2020 when I had three shops. He said, but and I said, what's the reason behind that? And he said, well, I mean, th this um, uh, amazes me. He said, you could take all the best staff out of all your shops and put it in one shop to win it. I mean, how pathetic that statement is, is beyond me because running multiple operation is a lot harder than running a single operation. Now, if I was that desperate to win and I took all my good managers out of my other three shops, I wouldn't have a business. Who would, who in their right mind would, would even contemplate doing that to, to win an award? You, you enter the award. I think the awards are great and you enter the award to be better and you enter the award to, sh to show how good you are. That's the whole point of it. But I'm not going to then take several of my key staff from several other locations to push into one shop by the way to push into one shop for a period of five weeks where they don't get inspected anyway you know the top 10 are judged uh, i think it's done by zoom now isn't it so yeah. that's the, the staffing thing is irrelevant but i can't enter and also he said well no one can do a presentation like you well i, I, I still don't know whether that's a good or bad compliment you know that's which I find a little bit bizarre. Um, <clears throat> and the other thing that frustrated me was I was told by Seafish to keep the trophy. And I said, I'm not going to keep the trophy because the trophy, it's the FA Cup of our industry. It's, it's got um, iconic, legendary names on there from 1986. You know, I'm not going to, no way am I going to keep it. But I was told back in 2020 that I would get it engraved. The whole the winners get it engraved. Um, 
They come and pick it up. They take it to an engravers in London. They engrave the trophy. They bring it back. Obviously, 2021, 20, I was told in 2021 that I was still the, the reigning champion. Um, and then N Triple F took it on. I was told in 2022 I was still the reigning champion. And then I said, well, who's getting it engraved? So no one got back to me. Um, so I went and got it engraved. I took it. I found out where the shop that had made the trophy. It was a place in Worcester. I took it to Worcester. I said to these guys, look, these awards are start. I was told the awards are starting back in 2023. I said, you know what? Polish the trophy within an inch of its life. I want it to look the best it's ever done. They said, you do realize the base has been cracked for years. I said, replace the base, uh, the base of the trophy um, and put the cod scallops 2020, 2021, 2022. Because I was told by Seafish and Triple F that until the awards are restarting, I was a reigning champion. No one's offered to come and get the, the trophy engraved. Um, pick the trophy up. Said to uh, Andrew Crook and Leslie at the NFFF, there's an invoice outstanding for the work, but we're not paying for it. I said, okay, you need to go back to Seafish. Okay, so go back to Seafish. Marcus Coleman, we're not paying for it. I said, okay. So since 1986, this, the, the governing body of, of the industry have paid to get the trophy engraved until I win it. Now you're asking me, to, to pay for me to engrave my the trophy that you want back that I've had for three years and I've had it polished, I've had the base replaced, I kept the base to show them the base was cracked. So it went back and forth and it was literally a week before the awards last year. No one was still paying for this trophy and I said, well look, I, I, I want paying for, here's the invoices, I've not, you know, I've not loaded, here's the invoice from the company, I've paid it, I've collected the trophy from Worcester. I'm bringing, and then are you bringing the trophy? We'll come and collect it off you. We'll get Barry from BD Science to come and collect it. I said, I'm coming to the awards. I'll bring the trophy. Are you definitely bringing the trophy? Yeah, but you need to pay me for the trophy. You need to pay me for the engraving. And I turn up two days before, I think they, they, they pay the agree, Entreplef agreed to pay the most, only because, by the way, I think David Miller had, had turned around in, in a meeting and said, this is ludicrous, you know, he, he, why should John pay for the engraving? It's, just pay for the trophy to be, you know, be engraved like we have done since 1986. So I thank David for that. Turn up with the trophy, um, they then see the Cod Scallops is on it, 2020, 2021, 22, they finish the awards, they send it back and get it all re-engraved again. Take the complete base plate off, N Triple F pay again to get it engraved because they didn't want the cod scallops on it three times. Now, is that just the most bizarre thing in the world? <laughs> I find it incredibly sad that they go through all this rigmarole to not even try and pay me to get it engraved. At no point did they say, John, you know, we want to get it engraved because we want to make sure you're, you know, we're, you're on there. They didn't say anything. They wouldn't even pay to, they wouldn't, in, they weren't interested in getting it engraved with my name on it. They weren't interested. So not only have I won the award, gone into lockdown, not had the benefit of maximizing from a business perspective at all, you know, um, from, from, from winning the award, um, I pay to get it engraved. I get the trophy polished. Um, I get all the dents taken out. I get the base re re redone. They're not happy because Cod Scallops are on there three times. So they win, they, they get the trophy back and they pay another five, six hundred quid to get it all engraved again. Why? <clears throat> and, <clears throat> and that is the chairman of the NFFF. That is our leader. That is as high as you're going to get. That's it. So, what I don't understand is <clears throat> why didn't they? And I don't know, you'd know better than me. I don't know how much trophy he is, but why didn't they just say there's 30 odd names on that one? We now start in fresh. Why not just yeah. do a new trophy and then you get to keep that one for argument's sake? Well, the point was, like I said, um, Seafish, I was told by Seafish, you should keep the trophy. Don't give it to the N Triple I. Triple F. I don't know whether Seafish fell out with the N Triple F. I don't know, but I, I was no. told to keep the trophy. I said, well, look, 
I, I don't want to keep the trophy. I mean, I would I would keep the trophy. Obviously, it's it's an iconic trophy, but but the whole point of the engraving, I just thought was was just childlike. I mean, I, I, I mean to to argue over paying for. I think to get it engraved and the base replay rep, replaced to get it all polished was about seven hundred quid. Wow. It was a lot of money. Um. And then they've gone and spent that again because they don't want cod scallops on there three times. But I was told, until the awards restart, you are the reigning champion, which makes sense. <clears throat> so yeah. I'm told that I'm the reigning champion, but I'm, uh, they're, they're not happy with the fact that I put it on three times. I just find it a bit... No, it's, yeah. it, it, it just sounds incredible. Um, but... I guess these things happen and I guess there's a meeting for a meeting. Someone sat down and said, Oh, we don't agree with this now. And that probably doesn't look good on you, but yeah, probably in my opinion, I think it just would have been easier to start with a new trophy. I've never quite understood why Seafish never also let people keep the trophy because they get, maybe the trophies are really expensive. I don't know, but I almost feel like that was about two grand. I think they're about oh, okay, two and a So, but, so probably but you could have a replica, couldn't you? You could, you yeah, could be a given a replica. Uh, yeah. as as in a in a nice uh, you know stand and yeah you know you, you get to keep that and it's a 300 quid replica uh, uh, and you know but yeah. they, they 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 buy a trophy and then you know like i said it was it was absolutely knackered when 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 it was dinted it was it was it wasn't in a great shape anyway yeah, yeah you're right entry bless should have said right the new awards Sponsored by whoever was it? Just Eat last year. Now they fell out of bed with Just Eat. You know what's 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 amazing with it all is, you know, it's. I don't want it to sound like sour grapes, but but I don't I don't get why, you know, we have Just Eat as a preferred partner with a percentage of twenty eight percent. If you're an N Triple F member, I ring Just Eat and I'm part of. I get it to twenty five with one phone call. So. The NFFF aren't doing you any favours there. Why would you be a member? Why would you be part of Just Eat through the NFFF and pay three percent more commission? Mm. Bizarre. Anyway. Yeah, that sounds <clears throat> that sounds like a bit odd. Hmm. Yeah. But they were they they you know they were in bed with Just Eat and 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 you know he wants to make it like the Kebab Awards and I I think it should be a celebration of the industry. I think it should be a dinner event. I think it should be black tie. I don't think we should tag on to the Kebab Awards. I don't think we should be the undercard to the Kebab Awards where we're at lunch and then it's the Kebab Awards at night because Andrew gets entertained on a main table with the guys from the Kebab Awards and you know it, we should be celebrating our industry. It's a fantastic mm. industry. It's it's you know the longest serving takeaway industry in the world isn't it you know <clears throat> going a lot longer than, than um, you know the rest of the sort of high beats from my point of view what i'd like to see and i'm I, I don't have any involvement with the awards other than being like you a guest now and and i think one thing i'd like to see which i think would be amazing is i i absolutely love london i love the capital i love the restaurants there i love everything in london but i do think now with this fresh format could they choose a different city to move it to every year yeah. because there's also lots of amazing places in the UK and yeah. and it would make it more accessible to different shops and different operators and different suppliers. So I, you know, they always, I think one of the old excuses, well, I, I, I shouldn't use the word excuse reasons that Seafish used to give was that, <clears throat> was that the media land, the media people were all in London. But I, said, I don't think that's true anymore. Like if you go to Manchester now, the, all the media is there. The BBC is there. ITV is there. Channel Four is there. So actually, you could argue that you could even switch it between London and Manchester every year because then it's northern and southern. So I think that Birmingham, would, Birmingham, yeah. I think there's so many options now. It doesn't always have to yeah. be London. And also, all the other venues. Well, sorry, in all the other cities, would probably be cheaper than London, um, which means you could probably invite more people and so on and so on. So that's just my thought of it, really. So, would you not enter any of the awards, like the multiple group award? Now, you can't. Well, we entered restaurant um, this year. We got top ten, I yeah. believe. Last year we got top five, um, but you can't enter. You can only enter one. You oh. can't enter mm. multiple operator and restaurant. Okay. So you've got to you've got to pick. And I kind of thought, you know what, restaurants one that I haven't won yet. Um, I would like to win it. Um, so that's why I entered a restaurant. You're not allowed to enter restaurant and multiple operator. 
Oh, I didn't know that. But I agree, I agree with the venue. I also what you know. I also think the food's woeful. And I said um, again, you know, not every finalist winner would want to do it. But I said, look, I I've done chefing of a fairly decent level, and 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 I could do a function for five hundred people, no problem at all. And I said, I think we could do. We should celebrate fish and chips. You know, we should have a really beautiful baked scallop starter. You know, a really good luxury fish pie for me and a, a, an iconic sherry trifle. I said, I would do it. I'll bring my chefs down. I would love to cook for the awards. I think it would be... Because you get this... You know, yeah, they're using Norwegian cod, but it's, you know, it's full of bones. It's not cooked. It's overcooked. It's it, It's bland. If that's celebrating Norwegian cod, then and the Norwegian Seafood Council must sit with their head in their hands when they get that food. But every year, you know, and I said, well, we could mix it. We could have a, you know, there's enough, there's enough of us in the industry that would would say, you know, let's have six of us that do it. You know, Richard Coleman, Dom Ord, Callum, I don't know, you know, ex-winners. Does ex-winners want to come and do a collab? We do a menu between us. We serve the food. I think it'd be great. Mm. be great but instead I it's mean, this it's been like that for years like like not knocking seafish or in triple f i think the problem they've got there is they're probably stipulated by the hotel so the hotel saying if you're here it's our food our food only um mm. and you know what it's like with hotel food as in hotel vo- at that volume for for groups yeah it's never that great um I barely eat at those things, to be honest. I have a good breakfast and then I just leave it. I just, I'll have a good <laughs> breakfast. Yeah, I'll go to the Woolsey in the morning, have a good breakfast, and then I just, I don't have to worry about lunch and I'll grab something later. And I think, I think for me, well, hey, I'm, I'm working as well. So I'm always in work mode, but the food's never that great. You end up pushing it around your plate and yeah, I'd, I'd rather not. Um, I, I'm sure others really enjoy it. I'm sure there's others that really think it's great. I personally don't, but I don't like hotel food for venues like that. I just, I've, I've never really been, I, you know, you know, talking to a guy that was forced to Cypriot weddings all his life. And that was typically the food that you'd get. It's, it's posh, but it's, it's not, yeah. yeah, it's not that great. Um, so moving on to sort of business things, you know, it's been very challenging in the last couple of years. What I was sort of wondering was how's the cost of living crisis, the recent cost of living crisis impacted your footfall? Um, I think the weekly takeaway, our hard and regulars, you know, uh, are probably every 10 days now, not every week. Uh, the, that weekly chippy tea is is going to be fortnightly soon, but probably end up being monthly. So we've seen a dip in that. Um, we've also seen a dip in, depending on where the shop is, what people, the spend per head, you know, um, weirdly on the delivery platforms, people over order and, and, and aren't bothered that they're paying, you know, 30% commission to get sausage and chips delivered. But we, we're selling lesser, we're selling, um, not as not as much product, but when they order, they're ordering more. So, you know, we might have a the ones that were weekly fish and chips are now fortnightly, but they'll have a few scallops. They'll they might buy a, a dressed crab. They might buy a bit of tempura or a soft shell crab. You know, they'll almost indulge a little bit more because that takeaway isn't as frequent. That's mm. what we found. Um, but yeah, you know, turnovers down by I think about twenty percent, which. You know, talking to other guys in the industry, I think uh, about where where everyone else is at. Um, you know, um, it's just one of those things, isn't it? You've got to tighten your belt accordingly and ride the storm. Have you seen a difference between sort of um, a, a, a movement, a change around between restaurant customers, takeaway customers, and delivery customers? Have you seen like, you know, has one of those remained stable while the other one's gone up and one's dropped? I think the the uh, I mean our clientele at lunch has 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 always been strong um, and, and it still remains very strong uh, eating that is um, takeaway people at lunch are, are less frequent um, evening dinner is where we've dipped more than anything I think people having the effort to go back out again people then you know wanting that nice bottle of wine with the fish and chips or even a glass of wine we've really seen that that's our 
point where we are we are down more than more than any other session if you like um click and collect still strong um i still miss that you know the the, the big queue on a friday night is gone and it's and it's and and what what happens there is you get less add-ons because people aren't people are in the queue and go oh i'll try a mushy pea fritter i'll i'll grab a salad from that cow you know i'll grab a can of coke or whatever it is because um they're not there so do that's ever, what we've i think do you ever see that returning that old fa- well actually i would call it old-fashioned but the way fish and chips was always where you just queue up order mm. it and go do you ever see that coming back i don't think it will i think it's gone i think it's gone i think i think the older generation have got used to click and collect the, the, they've learned how to pay on you know they've learned how to pay on a card uh, contactless or whatever um i, I don't think it'll come back I think it's just one of those things that have, 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 has gone forever. So convenience is, is king as such. Sorry? Convenience is king. Yeah, it is. It is. And, 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 and you know, the, the, everyone stood there with the tenor in the hand and looking up and the excitement and, you know, the... You know, I remember as a you know, you remember as a kid, you know, you, you, your mum would put the plates in the in the oven to get warm. She'd butter the bread and butter. You'd get on your... I'd get on my BMX and go and fetch the fish and chips and... It was exciting, this, you know, this, that sort of smell of, nothing beats it, the smell of sort of vinegar on hot chips and, you know, the, the, the getting home and, and the, the whole, it's an experience, isn't it? It's, you know, it's, it's, I think coastal shops will still have that. I think coastal shops still have that massive queue. And, but yeah, it, it, inland, I think, I think we're, we're nowhere near where we were. No, no, I, I see that. I think a lot of people sort of report that is that, you know, convenience is sort of king, that people want to stay home, order their food, and if they do come into the shop, they want to be in and out as fast as possible. It's almost like seeing a queue now just makes people think, yeah. oh my God, I can't do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So how has that affected your menus then? Because if you can't do the upselling that you used to do, natural upselling when people were in the shop, how have you evolved your menu to sort of adapt to that? So people maybe see those items online, let's say. We just, we're, we're just prominent on social media. We, you know, we're, we're, uh, we, we took on a girl called Liz, who's been fantastic for us. Um, she does all our social media. Um, you know, we started doing the the Fishy Friday videos to, to sign a showcase. We started by showcasing new species that were on the menu, but we've got, you know, I think we're on, I don't know, 70 odd videos, 70 odd recipes now. So we are getting a bit repetitive. But, you know, if we're doing, you know, we're doing a deep fried uh, hot cross bun, chocolate filled deep fried hot cross bun, which we're starting for Easter. You know, we just stick it out on social media, you know, do a little video, um, post it. And that's how we get the sort of people talking about it or, or, or the, the, the upsell, really. <clears throat> it's interesting because it feels like social media is so important now, especially Massive. video and photo. We, we need to constantly tell customers or remind customers, here's what we do. And it's almost like your menus have to evolve and be ephemeral at the same time that, you know, you can put something on, take it off in two weeks, but it, it stayed on for that period of time. Do you, again, do you sort of pine back to those days when all you had to do was make the product, sell the product, whereas now you've got to sell it very differently? Yeah. Yeah, no, it's it's a different world, isn't it? But but I think people want to feel like they're part of your journey, they're part of the family. That you know that they engage with us on social media because you know, and, and weirdly, you know, we 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 posted a um, someone spraying the vinegar on the fish, mm. um, and it's had something like two hundred and ninety five thousand likes. Wow, work that out. It's mental, isn't it? <laughs> But I've always sort of said that what I always sort of always try to look at, like you get so many views, but that obviously or likes, but it doesn't equate to sales. And no, because obviously we'd wish it did at that level. <laughs> That'd be amazing, wouldn't it? If you had, you know, 295,000 extra portions of chips. Off. But yeah. it's always interesting because lots of people see it. And you hope that they then say, I fancy a chip a chip of tea from Costco mm. tonight. But it doesn't always equate to that. You can't truly see, you know, I always find with our social media, I could have a barrage of, you know, whether I put boosted posts, lots of content, and then nothing that week. But then the week after, you just see this huge influx. And I just wonder, 
you can't ever measure it as much as you'd like. No, um, no, no. Um, so we, we, we've we've seen a few. Uh, well, we've seen a few months of sort of more stable pricing and lower pricing. How has that benefited you guys at Cod Scallops? Um, I think we. Well, I guess you, you kind of uh, fish has come down a little bit. Um, I mean, we're still on tight grade cod, so we're we're still shafted on on that. You know, I know I know larger fish has come down, but but we buy tight grade, so that hasn't hasn't benefited at all. Um, batter and stuff's going. I, I, the, the, the problem you have, Stelios, is stuff comes down slightly, but then you've got batter going up by eight percent, nine percent, or whatever it is. Gravy going up by eight, nine percent. Uh, you know, minimum wage going up by ten and a half next month. Um, so you're almost balancing one with the other. You know, you're not you're not in a position where you're going. Well, actually, we're we're at a point now where uh, you know where I could take twenty p off a portion of chips, or I could take thirty p off a portion of fish. Now, you know, let's let's bring the prices back down a little bit. You're constantly going. Well, that that little bit more fat I've got in that haddock, I'm going to use for the minimum wage that's going up. At, so you're constantly just moving it, aren't you? You're, you're moving the, 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 the bit of profit that you've got in it to, 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 to subsidise the increases that are happening. Yeah. And and how are you sort of thinking of dealing with the wage increase now you mentioned it? Um, well, obviously, the, the, the God, uh, again, it's I, I think minimum wage should be £15 an hour. That's what I think it should be. However... The, the government, the, the benefit systems broke. So, so the government's word of, of getting people back to work isn't going to work. It's going to happen. You could you could pay twenty pound an hour. The people that aren't coming back to work aren't coming back to work because the benefit systems broke. Yeah. It's too easy for them to get. You know, we had a lad last week work with us, um, work with us for six months. Solid, good chef, turned up on time. Um, Got a letter from CSA because he's um, been chased for money for, for, for a child he's got. Quit. He said, the money I'm paying CSA out of my wages, I don't have to pay if I'm on benefits, so I'm not any better off by coming to work for you. Just left like that. And in fact, didn't he's not turned in since the 15th of Feb. Wow. He got paid on the 15th with a deduction. And that's the problem. That's that, now that guy. We took a month to train. He was solid. He was really good. Turned up, really good part of the team. Um, made an effort. Cared. Good at his job. Could have got a pay rise. Quite. You know, we kept saying to him, "Look, next month you're probably going to get a bit more money." Gone. Because that. But so the problem you've got is. But yeah, coping with minimum wage is. It's just something we are looking at altering the working week slightly so we're looking at um the people that are on salaries lowering their working week hours wise um to compensate a pay rise so you know you take six hours so they do a 42 hour working week instead of a 48 that six hours equates to a 10 percent pay rise we're looking at that as an option but at the moment we think that they won't be able to do the job within the yeah 42 hours so we're just gonna have to stomach it and and pay uh, looking at your website earlier, your site's all open all day. Have you never seen a benefit in closing in between? Yeah, we used to close in between. Um, and, and then what happened was we, we ended up um, having staff here anyway to get ready for the night. So we'd have we, we'd have that crossover. So we'd have someone on a 9-3 and someone on a 3 finish. Uh, uh, and then, But we'd shut the shop between 2.30 and 4.30. And I used to think, well... They're in the building. You know, we're never going to be as busy. We're, we're starting to do, um, we get a little bit of a tea time rush for the kids. You know, that quarter to four, out for tea. And I thought, well, you know, you, you finish at 2.30. Say by the time the last customer leaves the restaurant, you're three. You've got to open back up at 3.30 for the tea time rush. And we've got staff on site. We have minimal staff. We have two, two bodies in the building between three and five. So... Which is which is you know they're getting ready for the night anyway. But we've we've centrally we've we've saved a bit of money, so we centrally make all the mushy peas now. Um, we vac them in kilo bags and send them out, which has saved an hour a day per site. You know, so five sites, five hours a day. So we've been a bit smarter with that. Um, 
and we're a bit smarter with making everything here before we send it out, which I know isn't for everyone because they haven't got a central production unit, but we have. So we have been a little bit keener with, with shaving hours down. Um, but it, it's just, yeah, it is what it is, isn't it? Yeah. Um, in 2022, you mentioned when we spoke, or whatever it was, because we've got the date wrong, um, <laughs> you, you, you mentioned that uh, battered versus other products was 60-40. What's that look like today? Uh, what, sorry? Uh, battered fried foods was about 60-40 yeah. um, versus non-fried foods. Would you say that's still similar today? Yeah, I would say it's about the same. I mean, I mean, what? yeah, I think what I've noticed is um, people revert back to – you know, rather than them trying a bit of baked mackerel or a bit of Cornish sole, they revert back to cod or haddock because they think, you know what, I'm only get, I'm not having this as much now. Whereas back then, you know, they'd have the chippy tea on a Friday, but then in the week they'd have a bit of baked fish. Well, that baked fish in the week's gone. Yeah. So what happens is they'll alternate between a baked and a battered on, on, on the various weeks. So battered's probably a little bit more now. I'd say battered's probably 65, 68% baked, okay. a, a little bit less. Because I'd imagine from a menu development point of view, frying product, well, it's not even imagine, it's in my experience as well. Um, frying product is a lot faster. It's a lot more, you can knock out so much more volume through the oil yeah. than you can through an oven. Um, so does that make you think, should we focus more on, like fried products because customers sort of like it they're fast i can get them done out of the way whereas anything that involves standing on top of a grill with multiple components that's going to slow me down and maybe not make me a lot more money either no well um, you know we, we we sell a baked a baked cod at the same price as a battered and it probably takes a little you know but i think we, we've got you know decent rationale combi ovens in all sites it takes about four minutes to bake a piece of fish um, unless it's a thick piece of salmon obviously but a thick piece of salmon is going to take six and a half to, to fry anyway so um yeah we yeah we have i mean we've moved a little bit i mean dress crabs was one that we've took off because um a we couldn't get them we were ordering them from norfolk and, and, and ordering 60 crabs and eight were turning up oh god because they were they, the transport the issues you know back with transport fuel costs you know um people in norfolk were selling them to people in norfolk it was simple as that so we now do a soft shell crab, which is battered. Um, we've took prawns off and we've done a, a, a panko crumb prawn again because um, it, it's just a bit quicker. So we are we are moving a little bit towards a little bit more um, battered product. But then we have, you know, we are bringing in, um, which I never thought I'd say, we're bringing in kebabs. Mm. So we're starting on our next menu will be um, a sort of charred, tandoori um chicken kebab or, or a halloumi or um a, a cod so we're going to move on to um what's the but again a lot go of... on oh, sorry is that what sorry no what's the thought process behind going down the kebab route then um i think when we well when i looked at dripping and, and i looked at i'm missing out on a family of four one doesn't eat meat I'm completely missing out on their order, their tea. They're not going to two places for the takeaway. They're going to one that all four can get a meal from. The thought process behind the the, the chicken kebab was if another family of four and one doesn't fancy fish or anything or sausage or pie, I've lost them. I've completely lost their order. They're not coming to me. They're going to go to a shop down the road and get a doner kebab and, and fish and chips or whatever. So... The thought process now, whether it works or not, I mean, we've not launched them yet, so so we're we're just waiting for the menus to come <clears> back. But it'll be in the next few weeks, the thought process was that family that want a mixture of some fried fish and and a, and a, and a kebab have the option. Okay, it's not going to be a doner meat, and it's not, you know, it's it's a chicken breast and it's marinated and it's cooked properly. But at least we're giving them an option to maybe have it with us. That was a thought process. Oh, and chicken's quite popular at the minute. I think a lot of people do like chicken, so yeah, you know, it's not a bad idea. I think you mentioned beef dripping. You did decide to switch from beef dripping to sunflower oil, and that caused... Mate, I, I'm surprised you didn't think come off social media at the time, to be honest, mate. Even I considered coming off social media because I followed you. <laughs> like, and, and like, So you decided to, as a business, to come away from beef dripping. What year was that? Uh, two years ago, maybe? So that was twen so 2022. Yeah. The Woolerton show. Yeah, we, we, we went off dripping everywhere. 
Um, I was trending on, on social media um, for about two days. Uh, we, we got in the Sun newspaper, um, a big article in the Sun saying, um, uh, Cod Scallop causes outrage uh, by taking beef dripping off the menu. Um, someone wrote me a letter, a, a really th- like three page letter, and said it was the biggest disaster to Nottingham after COVID. Oh, wow. Um, which I thought was 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 quite apt. Um, so yeah, that 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 was that was that. And then literally, uh, my thought process was always, if I did another shop in Nottingham to move one shop back to Dripping. So we which we did. So when we opened uh, the Wolford Lane um, shop, I've literally got either side of Woolerton within a three mile radius shops that do um, vegetable oil, and so we turned. Woolerton back to beef dripping but we didn't see any increase so at what, all. what was just the thought process it was just more we could serve more customers by doing this yeah well I just thought if it, people that wanted that traditional beef dripping you know I've got three shops within a nine mile radius I'm thinking well if I've got one shop the plan was always to do one shop we're going to be beef dripping um one shop we're going to focus on potentially doing some more sushi and sashimi and things like that um we're in the process of of looking at developing that for one shop. And then the other shop, we were going to do a sort of almost like a gourmet range of pies. So like an ox cheek and kidney pudding, a, you know, a pheasant smoked bacon and leek and kind of go down. So you get the main menu will be the same. Yeah. But then if you wanted some sushi or sashimi, you'll go to the Wilford Lane shop. If you want to fry and beef dripping, you'd go to the Woolerton shop. If you want today bigger pie selection um you would come here to the mansfield road shop so that's we're, we're looking at that at the moment doing various bits which will hopefully be later on this year so you've gone back to beef dripping then you've never seen any difference that all those moaners all those people that sort of went off on one they just carried on I mean, ironically, um, after after the backlash on, and it was a backlash on social media. I mean, my wife um, was taunted at the school gates, um, dropping the kids off. God. Um, I think they said something to, her, "Oh God, your your business is ruined now, isn't it? Now you took dripping off." As she's dropping my uh, then six year old uh, son off at school, and she's like, "I can't." <laughs> she rang me. She's like, "I can't believe it that I'm getting." Yeah. So it was. I mean. But you know what? It, it, people re- people obviously really cared. Yeah. You know, they really care about our brand. You know, we're really strong in Nottingham. Um, they cared about the product. But ironically, the, the regulars didn't even know that we'd swapped because we swapped four weeks before we announced. Because I said, let's swap it. And if we get one person comment at all about the, the, the quality of the product... We'll, we'll we'll move it back, and I didn't get anything. Hmm. Did you have to do any extra development? Because obviously, with beef dripping, it's higher it's higher in saturation, so it's easier to get a crispier product. So you moved over to sunflower oil, which is lower in saturated fat, um, and because it was higher lake, it's higher in um, ooh, monounsaturated fat. So did you have to do anything different to get the same product? No, not really. I mean, what I found was, I, I mean, I still believe that chips are better in dripping. Mm. But I, what I do, what I do think is, the fish. I thought the fish tasted a lot nicer in, in 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 the rapeseed oil. I just think it's it's a cleaner taste. It doesn't sit on you as much. Um, but no, we didn't change it at oh, all. So it's we rapeseed, didn't. not sunflower. Yeah, no rapeseed. Oh, yeah. okay. I didn't know that. So yeah. because that sort of weeps out the product a little differently to like drippings. I don't know if you noticed mm. on packaging. You'll notice there's yeah. a lot of blotchiness, isn't there? Yeah. Um, so it's interesting that you didn't have to change anything to make up for the difference. Um, but yeah, it's interesting how customers, sometimes a friend of mine always says, uh, those customers that make the loudest noise don't necessarily make a lot of difference to your business. And um, no. and if you never saw a downturn to the business, then well, if there was, no. then you would have made a decision, wouldn't you? Yeah. And, and it's a bit like when you put the prices up, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, uh, and again, you know, you get all these, you know, again, mainly from from Andrew at the entry left saying, you know, we're fighting to get the VAT down. We're fighting to get the VAT down. It's not going to happen. So, you know, I always have a, I always have three days of panic attacks when I put my menu up. But I'm putting my menu up out of necessity. I'm putting my menu up because the, the product into me has come up. 
you know, I've got to absorb minimum wage, I've got to absorb utility costs are astronomical, electricity is, you know, gas has come down, but electric's almost gone up. And, you know, um, you've got to be confident in the fact that, you know, you've got to charge what you charge to, to make you sustainable. You're not, you're not going to get a handout. For, if you get a handout from the government, then great, but it ain't going to happen, is it? <clears throat> it seems highly unlikely, um, well, especially this year, because obviously you've got a budget coming up in the next month or so, and then you've got an election this year. So it just doesn't seem to happen. And then what are customers' expectations? Are they expecting, if they finally understand what VAT is, are they expecting a VAT drop to them? So because <laughs> so you, you, you can you can imagine that if there is a VAT drop, the media, especially like the red tops, like the sun and the mirror, they're going to push it as this should now be cheaper for you. And yeah, and so I, yeah. I, I do wonder, like I see a lot of pubs saying that they need support and help, but can you see the government helping pubs? Because Obviously, alcohol, like smoking, is vilified now. So, I just, I just don't see pubs getting help either. Um, no. So, no. what I'd like to know as well is, you know, you're you're, you're growing a, a large group. Well, it's just it, it, to to the likes of McDonald's, it's a small group, but to Nottingham and East Midlands, it's a large group. And how do you? What are the biggest challenges in running such a restaurant group? Um, staff. Staff's the biggest, the, the biggest challenge. Um, I, I think we, we, we have some fantastic managers and we do, we have some fantastic managers that, that really buy to get people to buy into you, um, is very difficult, but we, we have a very good core level of management that, that really buy into us and have been with me, you know, a long time. Now I'm not saying that they might not leave soon, but, but, but at the moment, you know, that they're fine. Um, the the lower end, the sort of students, the part timers are really good, and, and I mean really good because I think they need money to survive. You know, that the, the, they're a student that the, they need money. They've got to earn money to live. They're really good. What I'm struggling, well, what we struggle with is that middle supervisor, solid full timer supervisor up to assistant manager. We really struggle with. They don't even turn up for interview. We've had a, a job advertised um, a supervisor here. Um, 16 people have applied. We've phoned them. We've arranged trials. How many turned up? Gone. None. <laughs> None. <clears throat> and these are people that, you know, on paper look like they've they've got um, responsibilities, you know, they're, they're mid thirties, they're, they're mid twenties to mid thirties. One's one was a supervisor at Rick Stein's Fistral Beach. I'm thinking, well, she's relocated to Nottingham. She lives two miles down the road. This is perfect. And, and you know, I said to her, "You are perfect for us. Don't come in for a trial. Just come in and have some fish and chips on us with your family to make sure you like us, and we 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 just introduce ourselves." No problem. So, she didn't turn up. Do you so, that, the biggest, yeah, staff is the biggest headache for us. Do you think the likes of Indeed and all these online job ad companies, do you think it's almost become a bit like like Tinder, almost, where people just keep swiping, looking for the next best thing? I, I don't know whether, if they look like they've applied for a job on Indeed, does that then tick a box for their benefits? I don't know uh, that that we had this we had this conversation last week in our in our management meeting, and I said, "Is it the fact that they can show they've applied for five oh. jobs? Does that mean they're actively seeking employment?" Or I, I don't know how it works, but yeah, I think that I think they have a bad day at work. They get home, they apply, and then they probably wake up in the morning and go, "You know what? I, I, I won't." But what I find frustrating is Stelios. They they answer the phone, they arrange a trial, They we then confirm the day before, you know, via message. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. I'm really looking forward to it. Why go through all that and then not turn up? Yeah. It, it's so strange, isn't it? It's it's such a weird marketplace now that, that I guess I'm trying to think years ago when I worked in my dad's business and 
people would just turn up for an interview but never come for the trial or they'd come for a trial and then they'd never come back. And we just factored in that that was just a regular thing, I guess. But yeah, it is weird now. Maybe it just happens faster. But I guess from their point of view, they probably think, well, I found something else better. I don't need to get back to them. But I always think that's burning a bridge. I think if they'd found something that they perceived as better at the time, they should just message you and say, look, you know, I really wanted to do this thing. But I I found something that I think fits my life better. And I'd like to go do that. Yeah. Um, But yeah, it feels like nobody wants to do that no more if it was really strange um, but, and also no. you, if i remember rightly as well you there's lots of benefits working for you guys obviously you you, you pay what you pay but then there's also like if i remember correctly there was mental health um, um insurance and so on and so on yeah we did we did sessions i mean we stopped the we had private health care yeah. um which we stopped because we we, we just realized that that um i think 88 percent had not even signed in to, to register that the fact that they get um private health care so we 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 shelved that but we do set we're opening our contracts we say look we're here on a on a one-to-one basis to, to discuss anything that you need to discuss support you financially through through anything you know and we do you know we we, we you know we do go on and above but getting people the, the ones that stick it, just stick it. I mean, you know, Bramcat Lane, we've had the same team there for, for years. And I think what happens is they just end up almost becoming the second family. Yeah. So, which is what you want, you know, but, but Bramcat Lane, we, we've had, yeah, I, I think that they've all worked there over five years. And even the part-timers, when they've gone away to uni, they come back and it's almost like, oh, it's like a long lost cousin that's <laughs> been traveling for years, come back for Christmas and, it's it's great when you get it like that, but yeah, the the, the biggest headache is is um, continually getting the staff to to buy in. I think, but, but yeah, yeah, and so, I, I would imagine many listeners listening to this would agree. Uh, I think that staffing can be a, a difficult issue, and and there's no real easy ways to deal with that yet. You mentioned earlier that minimum wage should be fifteen pound. Um, many operators that I speak to would be screaming at that, but you made also the point that the benefit system is broken. Um, if it was 15 pound, do you not see an issue with the level of person you get at 15 pound an hour? Because then you'd, for what you need, you probably need to pay an 18 pound an hour or 19 pound an hour because you want someone who knows your job a bit better. I, I, I think the fifteen pound an hour should be subsidized by the government. So I, my, my theory was, your benefit system, you come to work and, and as an employer, you we pay £10 an hour and the government pay £5 an hour to subsidise, to keep that person at work. So your benefits are, are non-existent. So you ben- the, the more you work, the more you'll earn, the more the government will give you, the more we will give you. So it's, it's almost a, a, a collab between the employee and the, uh, the employer and the government where they subsidise in the wage. And when they get to a level, yeah, then you pay £18 an hour. But I would be paying 12 50 13 anyway. The government are still paying their percentage over a period of time to make sure that that person's in employment because otherwise there's no incentive. You know, you know unless you've got some, some self-worth, there's no incentive for you to get up and go to work because it's too easy not to. Yeah, you know that classic example. The guy last week with CSA, you know, perfectly adequate, perfectly perfect to, to come and work for us to do forty hours a week. But you know what? I'm going to go and sit at home because I'm not. I'm not any better off. I think the problem is with someone like him. He knew about his obligations before he walked through your door. Of course he did. Yeah, he knows. He just chose to ignore them, and then he's probably been yeah. forced to go to work. Um, from someone I don't know who. He's probably been forced to go work from some sort of government department, and then. He's come and then pretended it was a big shock hoo-ha and then walks out. Well, actually, if he'd faced up to his responsibilities, because who wouldn't want to, you know, pay for a child and help them, you know? Exactly. Yeah, yeah like, yeah. you know, so it, it, that's obviously part of a wider issue. But, you know, to make that your issue is really unfair. And actually, someone from, like, the work department, you know, they should probably get in touch and say, no, this person, you know, should be working. And, you know, and I do think there is probably people that just, go to interviews to say, I went 
and they've got yeah. no and I, I know years ago they always said they were going to deal with this the government but i wonder how far off they are because it doesn't seem at the top of the list and but yeah you're right but then you know that that type of person if he could you know he probably was good but he probably ran out of steam after a week anyway the truth is if he can't be bothered to come to actual work to earn a living to then give some to an ex to look after his kid he probably wasn't going to be a productive person in your business anyway um, no no but but i think that that shows how you know that's just one one example isn't it no, I, get I think I, I think the benefit system we should be subsidised here to keep people in employment and give them a decent wage. And, and that's got to be uh, us com- contributing, but also the government contributing, but it comes out of the benefit system. I think at the very least for a short period of time, I think because yeah. once someone's in Jimmy work, Taggart, yeah. yeah, once someone's in work for six to nine months, th- that's it. The government shouldn't have to do anything. They should, but yeah. you know, could they, pay for his bus fare or her bus fare and give you money for uniforms and training. And I think there's probably an argument that says they could. Um, It's such a tricky one when you talk about employment, because there's some winners and losers everywhere. And, but you know, the big companies struggle as well. And so do the small ones. I don't think anyone's, I think everyone's expectations on staffing have really changed. Like um, I was saying to someone earlier today, actually, a customer of mine that years ago in every business really um and i know this is really generalizing massively and i'm painting everyone with the same brush here but years ago when you'd give shifts out people made their life plans around the shifts now it feels like people make their work plans around their life plans and i think that sort of probably shifted a little bit after covid that People want to enjoy life a little bit more. Yeah, no, I get it. Work-life balance—it's—it's—it's it's, it's key to everything, isn't it? Yeah. But there's a commitment, you know. If you're committed to, you know, we. But rather than us looking for full timers anymore, that you know, I think gone are the days that people want more than forty hours. You know, people see full time now as twenty-five to thirty-five hours a week, and and good luck to them if, if they can survive on that sort of income, but. We try and look for two or three rather than looking for one, so we have flexibility within within the rotors to, to, to make sure that they, you know, they want a weekend off. They don't want to do three nights. You know, we have a multiple of day shifts, afternoon shifts to try and get them to, to 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 understand that yeah, we do need people on a Friday and a Saturday, but we don't need everyone. Yeah, you know. Nice. So we've got I've got 90, 98 staff I think at the moment, wow. which is quite a lot. Yeah, across how many sites is it? Five sites. Five, yeah. yeah. But I guess you're running restaurants as well. You've got the prep unit. So, mm, yeah, it, it seems quite steep. But I guess if you're still, if you're still struggling at that, where would, you, where would the figure be for you where you'd be comfortable, do you think? 110? 110? Yeah, we were, we were at 112 um, summer last year and, and we, were, we, were, we were fine. We were, you know, pe- pe- you almost. Not in a bad way, but you almost didn't have enough hours for the people on the rotor. But but then we'd we'd encourage people to have a week off. You know, you've got so much in your holiday fund. Why don't you take a few days? You know, because you're managing that as well. Because what you don't want to do is get to the end of the, your financial year or your, your holiday year, and, and everyone's got three weeks to take, and you've got a week for forty staff to get three weeks holiday. And so we were very good at making sure that people. Yeah, so we're. Probably 110. We, we were we were bang on. Yeah, bang on. Yeah. <clears throat> you, you you recently closed one site. Where was that one? Market Harbour. Market Harbour. That's it. Um, what were the re- reasons for that one closing? Had a massive uh, massive um, altercation with the landlord. Really, um, we took the building. The building leaked. We had water ingress in in the front section of the of the building. Um, he wouldn't fix it he would send a maintenance guy with a tube of silicon and to stand on one of my chairs on the inside and try and fix it i sent him video after video of of water ingress and he came and he said well it only leaks when it rains on an angle john and i said yeah i know but it leaks the the point is it leaks um so i'll be honest you know with we we try i tried everything I, i i withheld rent I, uh, within the lease, um, it didn't allow me to fix anything exterior to the building. So it was a glazed section that needed um, 
refelting and resealing to the building. You, you could see where it was leaking. It, it, it leaked in um, where a concrete pillar met, met the glaze section. Um, he wouldn't allow me to do it. Um, so we paid the rent. Then we, you know, I called him a, everything from, from, you know, I tried to be nice to the guy. I, got, I, I rang him when it was raining and, and met him there. And he said, well, just, just put a tea towel down. I said, so you want people to sit? in a sodden, um, I said, well, sit down and I'll make you a coffee. And he said, no, you're being ridiculous. I said, well, no, I think you are. So in the end, we just, I took legal advice and I just cut my losses. I just, I couldn't trade it um, to its potential because every time it rained, you know, we just had buckets of water and or buckets catching water and people stepping over it as you walk into a shop isn't a great look. So, um, and he accepted. So, yeah, we, we closed we forfeited the lease and, and moved on. So I have got literally everything ready to do another shop. Well, um, because of that. Because of that, really, yeah. yeah. So <clears throat> so when you close that, you obviously that gives you a bit more um, more resources to look at the others. But one thing I was looking at is you've got four sites in East Midlands and one site in East Midlands being Birmingham. Is, is that still the case? It's still in Harborn, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Does that cause any operational issues? Because obviously you're East Midlands based, but that's all on its own, like an outpost. Yeah, no, it, it, it does. And the plan was always to do a little cluster in Birmingham. Um, and the plan is to still, you know, look, look at doing, uh, you know, another site to try and do, if I could do three or four Birmingham or on the way to Birmingham, sort of Coldfield, you know, wherever, I, I think um, it would kind of fill because we still send, we still drive over there with with the product um, three days a week, which which isn't ideal, but but it, it, it's it's manageable. The, the site, I think, what what it taught me as well is is um, you know no one knew us in Birmingham. We were just a chippy. Um, you know, we we open in in Nottingham. At, you know, we opened at Wolford Lane, for example, and for four weeks we've we're, people are going mental on social media because they can't wait for us to open. Whereas on, in Birmingham, it, it wasn't like that at all. You know, we were just the, the cods, what, who, who, you know, that's, that's what it was. And so it took us a lot longer to, to get established, but we're three years old, excuse me, we're three years old this year. Um, and we, we're, we're gradually building. It's, it's like I've started all over again um, because um, it's a different city. It's a, it's a different demographic. It's a different everything. So, but yeah, we got, that's why I haven't reluctant, you know, reluctantly not, not sort of pushed Birmingham. Now we're three years old and, and we look like we're fairly stable. But again, the, the biggest, the, the biggest challenge was, was getting a decent team, um, uh, which has took, yeah, near enough three years to get, to get a stable, solid, team because you know as you know you gr when you grow you know you, you're already looking at your assistant manager at that site thinking right she's going to be or he's going to be the manager at that site and that's what we've always done in Nottingham you know whereas Birmingham we were struggling to even staff it so we, we still you know we still periodically if someone goes off ill or someone um was was not there we, we send bodies down from Nottingham to, to to staff it which which again isn't isn't the see you know for, for the long term it's not sustainable is it so um but you know touch wood now we seem fairly stable there but um yeah we'd, we'd like to do an, another couple but yeah, that's the, <clears> that was the reason is it hard to motivate staff when they're at a distance like that yeah 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 i mean we we normally have so i've got two area guys um so they'll go down um in a van and they'll spend so one, one's gone down today and he'll spend monday tuesday come back tomorrow at uh, wednesday then I'll sort of periodically drop in and do a day there, um, and just kind of see the guys. But again, we've got a we've got a fairly stable team. I think the problem we had was people weren't staying, so we didn't really have a stable team. So we do do things in Birmingham for the Birmingham crew, but um, it was getting that stability. Yeah, it's just um, people would stay a couple of months and go, and and but so yeah, now we're we're we feel we're, we're fairly okay. <clears throat> so not amazing. Well, and, and I know you mentioned you'd like to open more outlets. Is that something that you definitely want to do soon, or do you just want to wait for the whole staffing situation to settle? It's it's it used to be driven. I, I mean, it was driven by I guess you know 
like like I just said, if I had a really good core team of uh, you know a, a sous chef in one site and a and a really good assistant manager in another, I, o- opening a site isn't easy by any stretch, but it's a lot easier when you're transporting the, the, the main spine of your business. You know, your staff, you've got a good fry, you've got a good front of house, you've got a good... It's easier to open because the product's the same. There's no... You don't have to spend weeks of training. You don't have to spend weeks of doing dry runs. You could literally get it all fitted out, do a couple of days of, of staff training and you open. Um, it's, it is... A lot is driven by that. So until... Yeah. If, if an amazing site... I still think landlords are, are a little bit delusional. I think that... They're still thinking that, um, you know, the rent should be what it was pre-COVID. And I think that's got to change. But they are, there is a lot more coming up. Um, so if I can get a decent site with a decent landlord and decent terms, yeah, I'd, I'd probably do something this year. But I'm not, I'm not breaking a neck to, to, no. to do it, you know. Well, like you say, you've got everything in storage. You've got a range to go. So that means, to be fair, the investment's already been made, hasn't it? So yeah, yeah. So it makes sort of sense, but like, it's good that you're not rushing to do it at any cost because that means you're going to jump into bed with a bad landlord or something, and and yeah, you don't want to do that. And hopefully this time you can maybe stipulate in the lease that anything like that can be sorted. Yeah, again. but you you, yeah. you you live and learn, don't you? And uh, yeah, you do. And I think <clears throat> you, you've got to be, you know, it was a it was a very sort not you've got to be savvy enough and, and not be you know just think it's all about the pride you know shutting a site isn't isn't an easy decision to make and you know um but but you've got to think sometimes you know this isn't going to get any better and 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 it it, it was you know you, you your sort of pride is oh god i've got to shut a site but actually you, you, you've got to do what you've got to do what's right for the business and and that was the right decision and and you know we were you know, thinking about we were out on a limb in Market Harbour, so we were Leicestershire, so we were even, we're an hour that way, we're an hour to Birmingham, we're an hour back to Nottingham. So um, it was the right thing to do. How do you sort of, from a, a generalised business question, you're in East Midlands and West Midlands. Both of those areas have lots of fish and chip shops. Um, and you're sort of, again, w- within the Nottingham Derbyshire area, you're one of the few that don't do huge portions and how does that work against you? Because obviously I know you're going for the quality side. I get that. But is there some customers that just can't get their head around your concept? Yeah. You know, people still want a wheelbarrow of chips, don't they? And, and, and for, for two quid and, and you're always going to get that. And, and like, I think you, you put on it earlier, you know, some people walk in, look up, you know, show me, show them the size of the box and they spin on the hills and they go up the road and, and get a wheelie bin of chips for, for, for a quid less. But I can't control that because what I don't want to do is, you know, sort of get the quality to, to sort of not be not be where I want it to be. I'd rather be right on quality and right on portion size for that cost um, because otherwise I'm no different to anyone else. Yeah. No, I, I saw this, um, an Instagram video yesterday and uh, this, it was like a short reviewer guy. He wasn't short. It was a short video. He wasn't short. And um, he said, oh, I've got this this haul for £22 or something. And there was like two large fish, battered sausage, jumbo sausage, um, two peas, two curry, and um, 1.1 kilos of chips. He weighed it. And I was thinking, wow, wow that's like you know, 1.1 wow. kilos of chips. I just thought, that's pretty incredible. What was <clears> that, £22? £22, yeah. So I, I swear it was 22 I'll have a look again. But, you know, even if it was 27 which is the other number I've got in my head, it doesn't sound a lot either. No. And no. Um, But 1.1 kilo of chips. The, the, the chips didn't look great. I'm not going to lie. Like, I, you know, for someone who loves carbohydrates, you know, like at, at volume, at scale, look at me. But, you know, to think that that's what they were doing. But, you know, he seemed to like it. It wasn't a paid thingy he just went in and did it but if you can see how that's difficult for other traders who don't do that because you know it must be tricky and you're in the east midlands and you have a lot of competition and then you go to west midlands where you've also got lots of competition but i guess you're not just a takeaway chip shop you have got a few more strings to your bow haven't you sorry you broke up there so I was just saying, like, you, just going back to the fact that you have got a lot of competition in East Midlands and West Midlands, but you do have a, 
a, a string to your bow as such, you know, by being a restaurant that does lots of other seafood items. Yeah, yeah, I, th- I think you know wh- whether you have a cod and chips or or, or, or some scallops or a, you know a, a battered cream egg or what, whatever we're doing at the time. I think you know the, the branding sits well, the packaging looks well, um, the products I believe is is still of an amazing quality. Um, you know, I think the price point is right. You know, when you look at chippies up the road that are, you know do I saw one the other day and <laughs> on the counter it said. Um, 10% discount for cash, you know, and, wow. and so they're blatantly, um, you know, not declaring all the takings. Um, you, you're always going to get, you've got to stick by what you believe in, haven't you? And I, and, and I believe in, in quality will always, you know, the cream will always flow and, and that's where we're at as a business. Yeah. Have there been any, I know you mentioned there's a few benefits to having the central prep unit, but have there been any downsides to having the central prep unit? Um, I guess on, only, uh, no, not really. I was going to say on, only for the fact that sometimes, um, when we're, when we're, we're, we're having to overproduce here, but, but at the moment, this, this production unit, I think could feed 10 shops. You know, we've got, we've got the right kit in, we put good kit in, we put the right kit in, um, Sometimes it's, you know, there's the ones where, I don't know, the, 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 the guy on the rumbling's running behind, so the other guy that's coming on the rumbling. So sometimes it's a little bit hairy when you get into a shop at 20 past 11 to drop the chips off, but, you know, we open at half 11, so we've still got 10 minutes. I think that's the only time that it's a little bit twitchy. Is if something goes here, if the rumbler breaks here, we've got two spare rumblers, but it's still yeah. a bit of a ball ache to get it swapped over. So we learned by or I learned by just having extra of everything. Yeah. So we've got three chippers, three rumblers, you know, uh, oceans of stock here because we didn't want to be in that situation where something goes down. So if something goes down here, then it affects five locations. So yeah. the biggest one was the lift, the lift broke. So we had to handball um, one and a half ton of chips down two flights of stairs um, the other Thursday, which was just... Uh, because that's unusual about your central prep. Most people would have like a warehouse, whereas yours is a couple of floors up, isn't it? If I'm right. Yeah, top floor. <clears throat> yeah. Wow. Yeah. So we've got a service lift that just didn't just didn't didn't decide to work. I mean, the engineer was on it all day, but but again, you know, it's it's preventive maintenance, isn't it? You, you know, we have everything serviced regular. We have all the all the units serviced regular. We have everything. We keep on top of it all because you, you don't want it to just go kaput but sometimes it does but yeah no I, it, having the central production has, has been you know great from for getting to five sites and knowing that the consistent you know apart from them making their own batter at site everything everything is the same you know yeah. we've even got it down to the garlic and herb oil is now made here the seasoned flour is now made here the you know every single product is made here um put mushy peas you know the other one that the other variable uh, you know um is, is made here now so it just means if you go to birmingham or, or long eaton within two percent it's the same product yeah or it should be that makes sense yeah or it should be um yeah. and obviously you, you've got a restaurant group how 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 focused are you keeping that cash flow going because a friend of mine once said to me um cash flow is the blood of the business you need it it's got to keep pumping round and how what strategies have you had to help you with that from the restaurant side yeah well just from the whole running an operation how important and what tips and tricks have you learned to keep your cash flow positive um i, I mean what we've always uh, we've never borrowed a lot of money i've never i've never i've never um I've never done a site and then had to borrow the money to do the site. Um, we've always done it organically. So when we've got enough money in the bank, we'll look at a site. Um, we might finance the, the odd frying range, but at the start, I never did. I pay, I bought everything outright because I just thought I don't want to then, you know, because then the break even is a lot lower because you're not having to fund, you know, you know, you're not having to finance or pay for the finance on, on a fryer and hundred grams worth of fit out. So we've only ever done it when we've got enough money to do it. So that I would say, don't overstretch yourself is one. Don't, don't try, you know, as much as some, I mean, I look at sites sometimes and I go, Oh my God, I would, you know, I saw a site um, in Stratford and, and I would have loved 
I love this site. I love this site. I wanted to do this site, but I didn't have the money to do it. And and sometimes it's it's the better man that says, you know what? It was it would have cost a million quid to fit out. Uh, it was a huge site right on the river. Fantastic. I could you know it could have been three hundred covers outside, one hundred and fifty inside. You know, right tourist trap, Stratford on Avon, beautiful. Every part of me wanted to do it, but I don't have the dough. So, uh, you know, sometimes you've just got to go, you know what, you can't do it. Um, that's what we've done. We've, we've, we've been quite, I guess, I've not always bought cheap. So, uh, you know, what, what the kit that you're putting in, you know, uh, you know, we've always put decent high-end fryers in, brand new. We've always kept up with the maintenance contracts because that's an ongoing cost. If, if you forget about that and then you get a service in for a fry, it's like a car, isn't it? You don't get your car service for five years and then you take it into Audi and they hit you with a three grand bill. You, you know, you fall off your chair. So we've always had it as, right, these are our costs. These are our fixed costs. Part of that fixed cost is depreciation. Mm. You know, we have it as a fixed cost in the business. We have it that we know that we're going to have to replace that. We know that we're going to have to buy another five grand's worth of uniform in, in 18 months, you know, so we're constantly doing and evolving. And we've always, um, I guess we've, I've always tried to buy smart. So I've always tried to get a better deal by buying a pallet of, um, and by having the central production or central unit, we've got three vans that distribute. So we, we, we save money by, by doing that. Um, but just generally you've got to, Trust in your product. Make sure you're selling it at the right price, and and trust in your team. How comes you never went? Well, I'm assuming you haven't. But how comes you haven't gone down the route of like Rockfish, where they've got investors and grew it like that? And you've you've just gone down a different path, a more organic route, from what I can tell. Yeah, no, we have, and 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 I, you know, we I've had a conversations with people that that have, are interested in. I looked at. I think with venture capitalists and, 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 and using people's money, you are then, it's not yours anymore. You know, you have to put everything to the board. You know, you, you, if I wanted, you know, if I wanted to close all the sites tomorrow and take all the staff to Alton Towers, I could do it. You know, not that I'm going to do it, by the way, but, but, you know, you are then, everything was just, to me, it wasn't mine. It wouldn't be mine anymore. I would be, I would be based around, I would be, I wouldn't be able to just go downstairs on Friday and, you know, I fried on Friday night. I loved it. Loved every minute of it. You know, absolutely. We, we, there was sure, there was no one else. So, so I'm in, I'm frying. Um, that would almost be taken away from me because I would be, uh, you know, sat doing spreadsheets and sat answering to a board and sat, making sure that that didn't tell him why you're paying that, that, and why have you done it, it, It's just too many loops and too many restrictions, I think. Don't get me wrong, using somebody else's money is a fantastic <laughs> theory, isn't it? You know, if someone said, here's a couple of million pounds on it, you know, go and, go and open four sites or five sites, great, but at Or what one cost? in Stratford. Yeah, yeah, or one in Stratford, yeah. <laughs> Oh my god! It's, I still think about it. I still. I mean, that was two years ago. I still think. I still talk about it now. I, I, yeah, it's it was brilliant. But anyway, um, so I've never, uh, I've never gone down that route. Um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think if in an ideal world, if someone was going to invest that had an understanding of the business, but would. Not, not necessarily lead me to do what I want because sometimes, you know, someone's going to give you a lump of money. They're going to want to know what you're doing. I think there's a balance. And when I've had conversations with um, VCs and stuff and, and they've wanted to put money in, I just walk away thinking, I'm selling my soul here. I'm not, it's part of me is going to go with, with doing that. Maybe the, there's, a, there's a middle ground where, you know, someone out there has got some money that they want to chuck at it that's that's in the industry and believes in me and and wants to see it grow to the next level then maybe we'll do that i don't know yeah. but yeah a bit a bit more uh, not quite the pace of a vc but not quite your mm. pace either somewhere in the middle and maybe they in give the middle, you a, yeah. yeah and maybe they give you a little healthy nudge all the time and make you question yourself yeah. a little bit yeah 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 well you need that someone needs to tell you you know you're being a dickhead sometimes and someone needs to I've say you know don't you don't even fucking think about that john you know that's that's yeah. the whole point of it isn't it someone needs to give you a reality check so yeah some somewhere in the middle would be great how do you 
maintain a work-life balance you know you work you've got these sites you're growing them or even just keeping them steady it's a business it needs a lot of effort but then how do you schedule free time for things that you need to do and everything you've got a young family as well yeah I do I do have a young family um I think I think I I mean I've I've had um I had I've, I had therapy for about four years to, uh, about this um uh, about just you know the, the old John and I call him the old John because he's not here anymore the old John would you know go to work at seven in the morning get home at 10 o'clock at night you know no one's going to do it as good as me no one's going to, you know, I need to be there. And that was the old John. And, and that was probably, you know, not, not that long before we, we were, you know, sort of five, six years ago, maybe. But for 10 years previous of that, that's all I ever did. You know, I, I used to say, I said to my wife when I met her, I said, you're going to leave me because I'm going to be at work. And she still reminds me of that comment. And I think it, it, it made me, my therapist used to say, you know, John, what's, what's the worst that's going to happen? And, you know, and I'd, and, and, and I'd sit there and I'd, I'd say nothing. She'd go, well, that's your answer. And that stuck with me, that, that, that thought process of, okay, it might be 2% less if you're not there, but the customer doesn't notice that 2%. If I can aim at 85% of, of capacity, you know, of, of what I would be at, if my my staff and the sites can run at eighty five percent of my expectations, then I'm winning, and I'm winning because they are. Um, so I, I, it took a long time, but but I do, you know, I used to, I used to feel bad for going home, and and now I, you know, I make a point of I write a list, I write a list every day. If that list is not done, I don't take that list home. You know, very rarely do I pull my laptop up at night. Um, don't get me wrong, you know, if, like I say, this weekend I worked, I worked on Saturday and, and because ultimately it, it was no one else, but, but we've got people in place now that, that I'm the last call, yeah. whereas before I'd be the first call because no one's going to do it as good as John. Well, that's bullshit. It's not healthy. You no. know, I would, I would probably be <clears throat> rocking now in a, in a, in a, in a fucking psychiatric ward if I carried on at the pace I was going. So I've, I've, I still graft. I still like. I still enjoy it. Um, but I go home. You know, I go home and I turn off and 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 I enjoy my family. And and but it's yeah. I, I think I think therapy was the best thing I ever did. Singularly, the best thing I ever did. The the original founder of George's Tradition, Andrew, said to me once. I asked him a similar question, and he said, uh, particularly about staff sort of quality levels. He goes. I've changed my mindset and I says, okay, he goes, I always thought that I wanted everything to be a hundred percent consistent a hundred percent of the time. Whereas now I want 80% quality a hundred percent of the time. And he yeah. goes, once I, once I brought my expectations down and taught yeah. staff how to always aim for that, anything above was a bonus. Like, and I think you're right. I think, you know, we all think we can do the best thing in our business. Whereas actually why are we training other people if we're on top of them every two minutes as well? Mm. You know. No, it's, it's 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 true, and, and you know, no one's ever going to care as much as you. But that's again, you don't. You, they shouldn't. Mm. They shouldn't well, care. It's probably as much unhealthy. As you. It's, it's probably unhealthy for them if they yeah. aim more. If they care more than you, yeah. So you want them to care, but you don't want them to almost go home and have a burnout because they're worried about your yeah. business. Like that's not healthy. Either, no, no it? way. It's not there. It's not. It's not in the. You know, it's not their. It's not their business to do, is it? So yeah, it's it's. I'm all right at the minute, you know, we're good. We, you know, I get home and, and I make myself do the school run. You know, I make myself pick the kids up, you know, not, I would before I'd say, no, I'd say to my wife, no, you know, I can't do it. Don't even, don't even contemplate asking me, you know, now I'm on the school run, you know, I'm picking my kids up today at 20 past three. So at 20 past three, I'll be home um, because I want to. Yeah. And what do you see as the biggest threat to not just your business, but the hospitality business over the next few years? Um, I think supermarkets are, uh, you know, you look at, I think just look at Valentine's last week, you know, no, I don't know any, any restaurant that, that was full um, in Nottingham. I don't know any. Um, and I think that's just a prime example of, you know, 
two stars, two mains, a bottle of wine, two desserts for 12 quid or 15 quid. Um, I think that's always going to, I think that's going to get worse. I think supermarket food as like it or low that, you know, the ready meals are edible now that the, the good quality, you know, I've, I don't buy a ready meal, but I bought a really good dry aged sirloin steak from Sainsbury's and it was bang on. It was bang on. It was, it was full of flavor. It was tender. It was, you know, it was everything I wanted out of a steak. Um, but I think that's one, one threat. I think the only good thing I would say is, um, fish and chips can't be recreated at home. You know, you can recreate a pizza now. Most, most people have got these Unos or pizza mm-hmm. ovens in the garden and, and you can recreate a decent curry to a level that, you know, is not far off restaurant or takeaway. You can recreate a decent Chinese, but you can't recreate fish and chips. So I think for us, our industry, it's the only takeaway that will never be anywhere. I've got a fryer at home and I can't recreate fish and chips as well as, as that in a shop, you know, out the fryer. You can't. So I think there's some sort of sanity or grace in that. Um, but I think the biggest struggles is is you know, just keep telling people to come and come and try us. And, and, you know, it's, people are creatures of habit, aren't they? And, and the more they stay in and the more they don't go out, the, the more, and that's why I think the pub sector is, is particularly tough because people sort of get home and, and they've got a six pack of beer from the, from the shop for a fiver and, and which is not even the, probably the cost of a pint. And they probably think, you know what, I'm staying in. So I think it's just, um, getting people to understand we're here humans need to remember that we are social beings and we've we now try to replace social media with being social and it's not the same thing at all and i think pubs have had increased competition from supermarkets for a long time because you can get a case of beers for the fraction of a cost of going to a pub i mean i think that's why for a long time they all started adding food to the menu because they thought well we can get them out for food as well you know and yeah um and you know you, you mentioned earlier about the staffing crisis um do you think and we're going to finish soon but do you think to some degree there are too many restaurants now um i, I remember reading an article um with a good friend of yours sat baines and he said there are too many restaurants that's why we have a staffing problem it's an old article it's probably from this point six seven years ago i don't don't know if you remember it but it's always stuck in my mind that there are so many restaurants now or what people perceive as restaurants or eating out foods so is that another thing just so much competition i think i think the staffing thing is a multiple thing isn't i think brexit has has been massive for for staff i think you know a, a, a lot of the sort of um East Europeans and, and a lot of the staff that were in our sector have just thought, you know what, this isn't Great Britain anymore. It's not that great, so we're going to go back home. Um, but I think you look at the amount of restaurants that are closing now um, compared to, you know, Sats article seven, eight years ago, I think is, is massive. I think, you know, not just lower end stuff. You know, you've got two Michelin star Raby Hunt closing. You've got Michelin star pubs closing. You've got, I just think it's, it's um, it's a difficult sector to sell to, to a young person leaving school or college. It's it, you, you've almost got to have a different mindset to get into this game, haven't you? You know, you, you know, I'm, academically, I wasn't that great at school. You know, it's a bit like the army, isn't it? You, you almost think, shall I go in the army? No, I'm just going to be a chef. <laughs> um, and I think it's a it's a sort of, but the people that do get it love it. So yeah, I just think it's a, it's going to continue to be there, but may, maybe it'll get a bit better. Hopefully, you've got to be a special kind of psychopath to enjoy hospitality. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you yeah. have. Yeah. <laughs> well, look, John. On that note, mate, we'll close it off. And um, w- will I see you in London in a couple of days at the awards? No, I'm not. I've been I've been invited. I'm not going this week. This year, I'm going to give it a miss. But um, are you down there? I am. Yes, I am indeed. Yeah. Well, uh, enjoy. Yeah. And Who's your uh, prediction? Who's going to win it? Do you know? I haven't. I'm going to be honest with you. I haven't given it a lot of thought at all. Um, I used to do this whole thing where when Seafish ran it, we'd all like do some WhatsApp groups and have a little bet on it. But genuinely, since then, Treble F started, I haven't done it at all. Um, I, I'm just too busy to. But I just think on the day when I'm there, I'll always go through like each category as they're calling it. And I, I like to pretend that I know who's going to win. But I don't. I'm, I'm usually way off. But... Um, I haven't really got a prediction if I'm honest I didn't think Jeff was going to win it not because I don't think he should have I just didn't think he would have and um, but yeah 
Um, it, it's difficult, isn't it? The, the shops, the the shops do look different. I think the years ago, the shops that were sort of in the top ten, we sort of knew a bit more about them. But post COVID, there's a lot of shops that we don't know a lot about. Yeah, no, no, but good luck to them all. Yeah, definitely. Likewise. And uh, all right, mate. Have a great day. Yes. Nice one. Thank you, mate. See you soon. I enjoyed chatting to John from the Cod Scallops. It was really good to get him on again. I think, again, in the future, as, as more things change, I think it'd be good to get him on again because it's good to get the perspective of the larger groups in the industry because they're managing similar issues just over a broader scale. Increase your sales and profits today. Order the Ceres Curry Sauce from Ceres.shop with free delivery across mainland UK. And remember, we ship to pretty much loads of places. So just go on our website, order what you need, and it gets delivered next day. If you want to keep in the loop with what we're doing at Ceres, then you should be following us on social media. But to get information and offers sent to your inbox, join our mailing list. Be sure to share this podcast with friends on social media. And if you like this episode, chances are your friends will too. Send it to them. If you do have a moment, do us a favour and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts.